The world doesn't provide you with meaning. Mm -hmm. the, the external uh, events do not have meaning in themselves. There's, they're neutral. It's us who project our meaning onto them. And so how do we do that? We do that through language. Mm -hmm. Language constructs a narrative of name and form mm -hmm. and storyline, and it gives us a place in that storyline. So we construct uh, our destiny, very literally, through that narrative of ourselves. Hello, welcome back to Soul Sessions with Creative Mind. I'm Deborah Brant Maldonado. I'm here with the fabulous and amazing Dr. <laughs> Rob Maldonado, and we are excited about this topic today, which is the power of your personal story can make you or break you. So we're going to get into that, uh, talk about some narrative psychology. Absolutely. But before we begin, I do want to request to help us out. If you could subscribe to our channel on YouTube, if you're watching us there, click the button in the corner. If you are listening to us on one of the podcast services, don't forget to subscribe because it brings more people to the show and helps more people get this information. So thank you so much. And so today, what's the story, Rob? <laughs> yeah, so there's a whole psychology of uh, narrative mm -hmm. and it's called narrative psychology. And then there's therapies uh, that evolve from it. And of course, there's deeper philosophical movements that predate these uh, psychologies and, and techniques. Mm. Uh, constructivism. Mm. So constructivism is simply a fancy word to say we are the creators of our story, mm. our narrative. And so we do create the story. Absolutely. And what we, you know, I think there's some kind of debate whether like someone impresses stories on us. But we actually, we accept them. So we have to take responsibility that even if we were around a narrative from our parents or our culture, mm. that we decided on some level to accept it. Instead of, mm. they told me I was not good, so I, that's why I don't feel good enough. It's like, well, you accepted it on some level. And so the only way we have power is to take that responsibility. Yeah, and our perspective, of course, is Jungian psychology. Jung would definitely say we're making up our story. We're mm. the authors of it. Mm. Eastern philosophy Totally. They would definitely agree by saying uh, our story is a type of dream. It's a type of a, uh, an illusion, an apparent mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. And then current neuroscience essentially confirms that, that our brain is a pattern making, pattern seeking, pattern recognition instrument that is always looking for meaning. Mm -hmm. And it creates this narrative uh, instinctually, automatically, mm -hmm. but we don't have to buy into it. Mm -hmm. So Jung says... If you, uh, the world will ask you who you are. Mm. And if you don't know, meaning if you're not the author of your own story, it's going to tell you, it's mm. going to give you a narrative from which to live, which is what happens to most of us. We're given our narrative through our culture, or our schools, our parents, et cetera, et cetera. And then our life history, we, uh, things happen to us and we, we d decide what they mean. And then we create a story around it. And um, I mean, I remember um, when I was doing love and relationship coaching mm -hmm. and I would speak to uh, someone for the first time and they were telling me their story about why they can't find the right person. Mm -hmm. And it's like in the narrative already, I could see within five minutes of speaking to someone exactly why they're stuck. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, th of course, there's much deeper depth to how you can go with someone. But even in the story, we can see how we limit ourselves or how we... Uh, you know, it, the story could be positive, too, and can be motivating as well. But the central character of the story is us. Absolutely. So this identification, uh, what does narrative give us? It gives us a sense of who we are, mm. right? Who is the hero of my life? Myself or sometimes others. Uh, often people have narratives where they are not the central character. There's someone else that is the central character. They're the, they're the uh, extra. <laughs> like you always yeah. say, I'm an extra in Debbie's show. <laughs> Joking around. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, but the identity piece is so important because it gives you a sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. And in Jungian terms, that would be the persona. Mm -hmm. It creates a sense of I am the, the character, right? Like almost like an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, having a role to play in the play of your life. And 
the narrative defines what your role is. And you know, it's interesting because we do this with other people too. We, we label them as characters. So the person that's rude at the grocery store that cuts in line or, or has like 40 items when it's a five item aisle, you'd be like, what kind of person is that? And you make that person a caricature uh, and it's, you don't know who they are. And so we do this with everyone. And then the people in our life, what, who our mother is, who our father is, yeah. our siblings, um, people that we married or divorced. And, you know, they, they all have these characters in our mind and we have a story, a narrative around them, like a backstory. Absolutely. And so why do we do this? Like, why do we create this? Like, we, we need meaning? Like, is that what it is? We well, need to make everything mean something? Yeah, but more fundamental, we need a sense of I. Mm. Like a focal point on which, from which to live our lives. Like, who is the one experiencing my life? So someone who doesn't have a sense of I would be, for instance, a multi multiple personality or, right? That, so that would be like a person who can't have a like cohesive self and that would be so it's good to have that yeah you're absolutely but that would be an extreme case yeah but, that's what i'm but saying but a lot of people have a weak sense of self and they're they're very much driven by the circumstances or a chameleon you know yeah, someone they're, who they're always trying to fit in blending blending in with the background kind mm -hmm. of you know not being noticed uh because they don't feel they they have that presence of being myself in the moment. What I find is that I've <clears throat> noticed in groups with friends and even with our clients, there'd be someone who's like a little more shy, a little more reserved, a little more introverted. And they would always hook up or match up and be buddies with someone who's very extroverted. And it's almost like that person is living out <clears throat> the other part of their character. Yeah, right? that's right. Um, and so we need that strong identity, uh, which is tied to the narrative. But as we'll see as we go on, we're not meant to stay there. Yeah. We're not meant to just play out the narrative given to us by our birth, our families, our schools, our, the, 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 the personal history, right, mm -hmm. that happens to us. Uh, that becomes the default narrative. Mm -hmm. And most people identify with that default narrative. So there's the identity that it creates, the narrative. There's the yeah. meaning that it creates. And also, to, when you think about narrative, uh, there's a great book. I'm sure everyone has read it. A Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, who found himself in a concentration camp mm -hmm. and under horrific conditions and facing death and the loss of his wife. Well, I don't think he knew his wife died, right? He held, his, held her picture and was, you know, focused on her. And uh, this idea that he said that we need meaning, you know, we, we, the way he survived is find meaning in even the littlest things. And, uh, and so when we're in extraordinary circumstances, meaning helps us in a way, uh, keep it together. Mm -hmm. Meaning uh, is kind of the, the ground that we walk on. Mm -hmm. If, if we don't have a sense of meaning in our lives, then we, we feel like we're just tossed about by the wind and the, mm. this, the, the waves of the ocean. And that's, uh, for us human beings, it, it's, it's a sense of being lost and mm. directionless. Mm. And, and in, uh, in current times, you know, you hear these news about people ending their lives because of despair. Mm. That is, th those are critical levels of meaninglessness. Mm. In other words, the, the individual just loses that sense of the meaning of their narrative uh, of their life. And when we coach our clients and we get to the root core fear, I, almost 90% of them say a meaningless life, like everything they're fearing, all the job stuff or relationship stuff. And it all comes back to meaninglessness is, is the greatest fear. So meaning is really important to us. And then how does this identity and the meaning create our reality? Yeah. So that's where the constructivism uh, philosophy comes in. So it says something like this in, in, in common language that the way we use language as human beings, not only to communicate ideas with each other, right, back and forth, but to structure our reality. In other words, the reality is, a, is amorphous and, and the universe doesn't really have any meaning except the meaning that we bring to it. Ourselves. In Buddhism, they talk about that, the emptiness of meaning, and then we bring, we bring meaning to everything. Uh, yeah, I think that's a little bit, the, the, the emptiness in Buddhism is a little bit different, but let's say in, in existential terms, yeah. uh, the world doesn't provide you with meaning. Mm -hmm. the, the external uh, events do not have meaning in themselves. There's, they're neutral. It's us who project our meaning onto them. And so how do we do that? We do that through language. Mm -hmm. Language constructs 
a narrative of name and form mm. and storyline, and it gives us a place in that storyline. So we construct uh, our destiny very literally through that narrative of ourselves. So, uh, for example, um, when my father passed and I was at this flower shop and we were looking at the flowers for the funeral, and at the same time, this woman's there uh, mm. getting her wedding uh, flower bouquets for mm. her wedding. It was like two opposite things. And we were facing this really sad moment, but we, she didn't know my father, so she didn't have that meaning and the sadness and the grief that we had. And we didn't know her and her husband and all that. So it's like two, we could be mm. in the same place, but we have two different narratives going on in our yeah. life. And, and yeah. we, and you know, with people like we, not everyone falls in love with the same person. Not everyone likes the same person. Everyone has affinity to people they love and care for versus a stranger. And so that's really where we start defining what's important and, and uh, who we give authority to, all those things. Yeah. And so that's the, the reality we're constructing. That's the reality we, we construct, and the illusion is that the that there is that there is meaning in the external, mm -hmm. right? People will argue this until it blew in the face that no, the meaning is out there, right? That happened to me, and it's bad, or or this happened to me, and it's good, and that they believe the meaning is inherent in the events or in the actions that people other people take. That's an illusion. The mind is very good at creating that kind of illusion through projection and through certain neuro, uh, neurological mechanisms. It creates a sense that I am observing. I'm simply observing. I'm walking onto a stage that's already built for me mm -hmm. and things are going on already. That's a total illusion. We are creating the stage as we walk onto it mm -hmm. through our narrative and we're bringing along the meaning of things within us just like in acting the actor kind of does character study of especially a real life person will interview them to step into that character with all that backstory all that meaning all that you know their narrative and then they bring that character to life through the acting we do that ourselves we bring our character to life and then that character has a, a you know based on that narrative that's the outcome of that person's experience. So yeah. if, the, if the narrative is I can do anything and I am invincible, that would, will seem to be that a person's experience. But it's always like people never show up for me. If that's your narrative, guess what? No matter how much you ask or keep boundaries or speak up, if you have that in your narrative that people never help me or I'm not supported, it's going to keep showing up. And you'll think it's out there, but it's really in your mind and your projection. Yeah. And you could say, no, 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 but I have evidence the, all these people in my life didn't show up for me. So how can I say that's not true? Yeah, so from this perspective, we can ask, well, what's the difference between somebody that's successful, happy, married, and, and fulfilled in their lives? You know, their life is not perfect. Nobody's life is perfect, but they have it together in a sense uh, versus somebody, somebody who's struggling, uh, is dissatisfied, is depressed, or mm -hmm. is anxious about their circumstances. What's going on there according to this model? Essentially, that the individual that is happy and fulfilled, they have a narrative that places them at the center of their story and empowers them. Mm. That they know they become the hero of their yeah, own story. In yeah, their, in their story, they have a sense that they have a purpose in life. Mm. Right? That they they're sure they they're here to do something special, and that they, what what they do is meaningful mm. and is helpful to others. That they're contributing to others welfare yeah. society and this this faith this belief right that this certainty that they have is very very powerful mm -hmm. again because language creates our reality mm -hmm. so they're essentially creating the opportunities for their own advancement whereas the individual that buys into the sense of the uh, meaninglessness um uh, nihilism, right? That mm. there is no meaning in the universe, that uh, nothing is important or that I'll never matter. Again, they're creating those circumstances for themselves through that narrative. So it's a very powerful way of uh, seeing ourselves. And then for us coaches, right? And people that we train as coaches, this is vitally important to understand. Mm -hmm. that the individual's narrative is often uh, at the core of what they're experiencing in their lives. It's the part you could see of your unconscious uh, patterns and conditioning is in right in the narrative. It's right there. Like you just listen to yourself uh, process an event. And, and then we teach this uh, 
um, exercise called self-inquiry uh, from Eastern philosophy. And if you sit with like an emotion and you're watching the narrative arise, but what we tend to do is we want to re- rewrite it right away. We want to re and get rid of that feeling or the, my favorite is everything happens for a reason, <laughs> you know, Oh, everything happens for a reason. And this, I'm going through this because it's for my greatest good. And we t- try to fluff it up and make it pretty in order to be feel more comfortable versus asking, why am I so hooked into this? Why am I hooked into this? And uh, it's because our identity is tied into it. Our meaning is tied into what this external event is. And that's creating that reality. Yeah. So where does it come from? This story, it comes from uh, our history, mm-hmm. right? The, the things that we experience, especially early on, those, those early experiences, almost every psychology agrees, early conditioning, early experiences, play an important role in everything. It's how our brain develops, how how we see ourselves, uh, this narrative, where Mm -hmm. does it come from, from those experiences. And it it literally structures our brain in a particular way Mm -hmm. so that for the rest of our lives, if we never do self-inquiry, like you said, this self-examination, it just remains with us as our main story that's who we are and that's this is what we can expect from the world so we're kind of like a character and then the world is this big place that we're trying to like survive in and we don't feel like we're a part of that defining that story we're just the kind of going for the ride and like like a cart being pulled by the horses of destiny (laughs) we don't realize that we can take the reins and and you redirect our life but most of us we had no one told us that we had this power, it's just wait, wait for the right timing, wait for a divine intervention or uh, wait till someone comes in and, and the right chemistry with the right person shows up or the right business opportunity or the right marketing message that, you know, that's going to get your business. All this stuff is externalized. And if you don't have the narrative that you're, you can be succeed or you can accomplish anything, you are deserving of good things. It will not show up. And if it does, you'll sabotage it because it doesn't fit your narrative. We see people, you ever see people that hit great levels of success and then they destroy it. It's because their self-identity, that narrative, it doesn't fit. So the ego has to tear it down again. Yeah, often go, uh, people go through life blaming family members, uh, teachers, bosses, uh, exes in their Events. life, et cetera, et cetera. We all do it. Mm-hmm. I, it, it. This is not pathology. Essentially, it's just, again, narrative. Mm-hmm. But that narrative is disempowering. Anytime mm-hmm. you're blaming other people, other circumstances, external circumstances for your results, you're giving your power away, mm-hmm. right? If you examine that narrative, it's, it's like if you're reading a novel and the, 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 the character in the novel is saying, um, so-and-so hurt me in the previous chapter, therefore I cannot succeed now. Mm-hmm. That's a disempowerment uh, pattern. In there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're going to play out this pattern because, again, the language structures reality. Therefore, they see it. Mm-hmm. They see it in their life. So that that's the, the mechanism of self-replication uh, in their story, that if you believe this narrative to be true, you actually see it, it becomes your reality, and then it feeds back to that belief that I was right. And so the purpose of why the mind creates this is to make sense of things, because if things didn't have meaning, it would just be us like getting up in the morning and, you know, going to work and everything's kind of bland, like it doesn't have any, well, some people may think, that's my life, I don't have any meaning, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. And so, you know, again, this narrative is really important because if we don't have meaning, it does feel like I'm just existing. I'm, you know, putting on my clothes, taking a shower, taking a shower, putting on my clothes, eating, going to work, coming home, watching TV, you know, doing something online. And you're you're just just like, you just described my life. I know. (laughs) But if, but it's just like a, uh, the the whole uh, the saying that the wise man carry chops wood and carries water mm-hmm. just like the unwise man and it's like you can do the same thing but you can have meaning and purpose in the things you do sure yeah I like that book uh, after the ecstasy the laundry the laundry <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Uh, you stole my line but sorry <laughs> <laughs> the, let's say why do we hold on to this story because like you say it gives us our sense of identity and meaning but we know there's psychological mechanisms uh, that are more survival uh kind of uh, oriented Mm -hmm. that we we need this this survival strategy that we've developed through our narrative because if we feel that if we lose it that if it's threatened 
by new information or this kind of mm. uh, kind of self inquiry, mm. like we're saying, that that has the potential to end my existence. Well, the existence is this identity, yeah. right? And okay. so I think, would you say that it is a sense of security? So would you say that, um, let's say, so, like, this is a great example. I mean, during the Depression, mm -hmm. a lot of very wealthy people lost everything. And they yeah. were jumping out of windows because they were so identified with the story and the identity. And so their story wasn't, I'm rich anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they just felt this, like, emptiness or this, like, meaninglessness, right? Like, why do I do that? And so you can see how we hang on to, what, like, our relationships, our money, our status, as ways to feel like there's some kind of solid foundation in the world. And if that structure is disrupted, that's where we get, we have anxiety. Like yeah. when you move to a new place, I remember when I moved to Colorado when I was 28, nine years old, I was uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Just last year. I was so like, ups, like stressed mm. out and like all my friends were different and I was in a different climate and a different job. And it was like a lot for my mind was like overwhelmed yeah. with that. And so the story, like, who am I now? And, and here's the thing that when it, we have a disruption in our life, it is a great opportunity to ask that question, who am I? And so when these things happen, like a business fails or relationship fails or so you get sick, uh, you have to go to chemo and you lose all your hair. And all of a sudden you're thinking, you know, who is this person? It's always an opportunity because the narrative that fits us before now has to change, which is a good thing. Yes and no, let's well, say, because, well, there, there's two points of view and okay. th this is not right or wrong, but it's more like, uh, what does, what do the different philosophies and psychologists tell us about this? So certainly one approach is, okay, if, if this is the case that we are creating our own, uh, our own life through, through this narrative, then let's change the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And let's create a positive narrative mm -hmm. where I'm the hero and everything works out, and I succeed. Mm -hmm. That that's a that's a good model, and most uh, most therapies, most coaching models op operate from that perspective. That if indeed this is the case, let's think positive. Mm -hmm. and essentially, make everything that, happens for a reason. Make a great story. Yeah, yeah. Eastern philosophy though gives us a different perspective, and 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 in part Jungian psychology as well, because here the approach is more of is there a perfection? Is there a perfect life that we can mm -hmm. aim for? Mm -hmm. Right? Like uh, turn everything positive, turn everything I, t I touch turns to gold and that kind of stuff. Um, there isn't. Well, I was thinking an opportunity is not to make things better, but an opportunity to know who we really are outside of the narrative. Yes, that's not right. Not like, okay, now I'm going to use this to be more successful or help me. It's more, okay, I, I'm hanging on to this narrative. I, and, and it kind of falls apart a little bit. It gives you an opportunity to, for enlightenment. That's what I was thinking. That's right. That's right. And what does that mean? It means that that not so much that you're going to make a better story, mm -hmm. but that you're yeah. going to realize that the observer of the story, the the one that is experiencing the story, is not the character that yes. you believed yourself to be. In other words, not the identity of the persona, as Jung would say, but that there's a... There's, that there's an observer in the mind, the one that is actually observing you playing mm. out your life. So that what I was saying is that opportunity is a, is the ego, like understanding that like you're not, you kind of, you can't rely on that ego anymore. So you have to seek something else that's beyond your character where your, your, your central of life is the foundation of your life is built around a character. And then when something happens that kind of tears it down or, or takes away the fame or the glory or whatever it is, you say, well, now is the time to ask, who am I really? And that's really the opportunity. Not to make it positive, but say, who, who am I? Why am I here? What is this all about? And who, yeah, who am I is the real question. Yeah, that, exactly. That's the fundamental question. Mm. Who is the one experiencing my life? Mm. Because if we are the, the actor, mm -hmm. right, the mask, as Jung mm. says, uh, we're identifying with the mask, with the persona, uh, we're, st we're still only trying to make a better narrative, a, be a better play for ourselves, instead of understanding the bigger meaning of, oh, that the whole thing is a play, the mm. whole thing is a, is a kind of uh, 
illusion uh, mm. or maya. Not that it's not real. It, it's real in the sense that it's happening and we're observing it and experiencing it. But it's, it's an illusion in the sense that it's not permanent and that the meaning we ex- ascribe to things is our interpretation. Mm. So that it's not an absolute reality. An absolute reality would mean the meaning is the same for all of us. Anyone that experiences that thing, that experience, would come out with the same interpretation. Mm. And that never happens in life. Everyone sees it from their own point of view, their own perspective, which means it's an apparent reality. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, why do we hang on to it? It's because it gives us some kind of like a foundational, like the ego is our ground, the first part of life. It, it becomes the ground from which we we live. Yeah. And when that's disrupted, again, it's like now we have to create a new sense of ground, which is a more spiritual, more um, uh, fluid uh, part of ourselves instead of a fixed limit itself. And so how do we change it? How do we change the narrative? How do we change the character, evolve the character? <laughs> to expand like because if you think about it the character can only has a defined limit of how much they can experience in their life the, the level of love the level of relationships um the type of um, money they make the kind mm-hmm. of work they do how talent how they express their talent uh how much uh, reach they have uh and, and influence they have uh but if they transform the character and they know that the character is just a character and they can play any role they want and they, they can write their own screenplay of how that character lives out the rest of their life. How we, we how do we do that? How do we really change? Yeah. Uh, so it's like evolving the character, but also expanding the capacity for that character to create their life in a new way. Yeah. If we look at uh, Eastern philosophies and, and some Western philosophies as well, and traditions, spiritual traditions, there were two ways. One is to abandon the role completely. Mm. In other words, to walk off the stage and to say, I'm not going to play this because it's simply like uh, being caught up in a drama that is going nowhere. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not leading me to fulfillment. It's simply like re replaying the same narrative over and over. Would that be kind of like someone who like shaves their head and changes the kiss a spiritual name or puts on the, the, you know, the spiritual garb and like, I'm this new person now, That's kind right. of like I'm abandoning the old me or That's even just changing your name. You're really just kind of identifying with this new character. Yeah. Uh, many, many traditional uh, spiritual traditions have this practice of removing themselves either temporarily or permanently from social circumstances in order to escape the narrative uh, mm. social structure. So leave their home, don't get married, or if you are married, you leave the wife or husband and you join the join the, um, the convent or... Change the name, like you say. Join the cult, you, even. A cult, people do that, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. It plays out in many different ways, but it seems to be an intricate aspect of human nature mm. uh, that that's one of the options we have. Just reject to, the character altogether. Yeah, uh, renunciation, it's mm. called in, in Eastern philosophy. So renunciation is definitely one. But then there are other philosophies that, uh, you know, in the Gita, Krishna is explaining to Arjuna that that's not the only way. You can also act without attachment to the results of, of uh, your actions, and that liberates you. In other words, it has the same effect as removing yourself from the social narrative, but you're remaining and staying in the act, in the Like loving the act for the act. Like uh, say you want to give and you love giving. So you give and you love it. And whether one person likes it or not, uh, like we, I, we always tell our coaches, like you, you share what, your knowledge, share your wisdom, but don't be attached. It's the, the heart and soul should be into the sharing. That's what mm-hmm. you're here for, expressing your purpose. But the results are extra. So if you get one person who shows up for your little workshop you do, or you get a hundred people, it doesn't define you. And that's freedom where a lot of people, we get caught up in success and the response. If my boss gives me that promotion, or if I uh, make this amount of money in my business, or if I get married, or if I'm, you know, with the right person, that's going to define me. And when we're attached to those things, we, we bring suffering with us. It's the cause of suffering. He says, is that attachment? And it doesn't mean we don't care. I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about that because a lot of people see non-attachment means like apathy or you don't mm-hmm. care and you're just yeah. kind of like, well, it doesn't matter anyway. And I'm just a spiritual being and I'm just going to float through life and, you know, nothing matters. Uh, right. 
Yeah. It's not that. I, Non-attachment is caring, but not, your ego's not attached. Exactly. Well, we see the great example in Gandhi. Uh, mm-hmm. His work was very important to him, obviously, and he was very dedicated to that work and, and to the result of that work. But personally, uh, he performed the actions as as much as possible, right? They, again, they, these are practices, not necessarily like complete states of, of being all the mm-hmm. time. But the practice was to take the action needed in the moment. For, for him, it was civil disobedience uh, to resist uh, the governmental structures at the time because he understood them to be leading people towards bondage. Not th- This is what's important. Not only his people or the, the Indian people, but the British themselves were caught up, were caught up in the act. And, mm-hmm. and therefore, he saw them as as being caught up as well. Suffering and, as well. And right? so the action he was taken, taking was both for his people as well as the British mm-hmm. uh, occupiers. Uh, now, th- this is a, an amazing idea, right? That liberation can be reached through taking action, staying in the world, but yet simply dropping the attachment to the result and continuing to act as your duty dictates. So for him, he saw his duty, obviously, as... Well, it was to liberate India from mm-hmm. uh, colonialism, and he knew uh, he understood exactly what he had to do. Mm-hmm. And his practice was then to do the actions required of that duty, but letting the results, you know, be the results. Whatever mm-hmm. happens, I'll work with that. But there's not no attachment to that. And he wasn't doing it like I'm the great Gandhi and I'm, you know, this leader. He he did it like he was a mm. tiny man. And it was more about the message versus about him and his character. Like he wasn't saving India. It's the principles that were saving India and his ideas that were saving India, not him himself. And I think the the important part of this is that you can change your narrative. You can make a better story about anything. You can say, well, everything happens for a reason, or, you know, this path was meant to be, and I learned all these lessons, and I'm, I'm more confident now, and, and, and really, you know, pop, prep up your character. Mm. But if you don't change your character, and you identify that this is really you that's out there in the world doing all these things, and forget about your true nature, which is like in Eastern philosophy, it's the witness, this higher awareness, that's really who you are, not this character that's acting in this three-dimensional world uh, that you uh, you won't be free. You're still just creating another story. And I always call that rearranging the furniture. It's like changing your beliefs or changing the way you talk about yourself or thinking positive. No, all those things are great. I, I don't think anyone should not do those things, but that's, a lot of people stop there. And then they, they don't change the character. Mm-hmm. They just change, they keep the same character with a better story. And so what we really want to do for true lasting transformation is discover who we really are. This transformation of the character from, or us identifying with this ego character to identifying with our true nature, which doesn't have the hard defi- definitions, the the uh, the barriers and the 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 guardrails around it. It's like this freeing self that's le- less judgmental, that's less um, fearful, that it or just wants to be expressed. Yeah, and so both renunciation and this practice of acting uh, with non-attachment lead to the same place, Mm. which is transcendence of this cosmic play Mm. that we're caught up in. Mm -hmm. And it's not as, it's not pushing it away. Uh, Neither one is really, the idea is not to push it away or Mm. to uh, reject it. Or even say this isn't real, so it's not important. Exactly. It's more to, to, to transcend it, to, uh, Acknowledge it and even honor it, mm. but to understand that we need to free our mind from it, right? Because when we're caught up in it, we're caught up in our ego. Mm. In other words, the story becomes about us. Mm. The, 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 the character we're playing is very much invested in what is going on with me, mm. what is going to happen to me, which is ego. Mm. It's, it's a limiting perspective on life and therefore it kind of traps you in this limited way of being, whereas the transcendence liberates you from that limitation. It's almost like taking time and space out of the equation and being right here in, in this eternal moment, yeah. right? That eternal moment of limitlessness and to be in that more often than in this kind of confines of this like appearing as a physical world with its limitations. We'd be in this internal moment and, and uh, 
and almost like where there's no narrative in a way. Yeah. Would you say that it's a no narrative? It's a place of like kind of um, not empty of meaning, but more um, we can drop the story and just be, it's a beingness. Yeah, it, it is meaning itself or, mm. or as, as in Vedanta, they say it's not being, it's beingness itself. It's not awareness, it's awareness itself. Mm. Uh, it's not bliss. It's it's not blissful, or in other words, it's not experiencing blissful. It is bliss itself. Mm. So that that is the kind of the center, right? We're reaching the center of our being, which is pure consciousness, pure awareness. And our brain is always doing that, right? When we get into situations, it's always scanning the room and it's always assessing. It's always, always, always coming up with these narratives and stories and and how it, you relate to it. And, mm. and it, it's me and that thing and uh, what I need to do and how I feel and this emotion and this tension in my body and this joy in my body and, and all this stuff. When uh, we went to the Grand Canyon, it was like, what, 15 years ago we went there in Arizona, mm. we went... And um, I remember looking out at the, the space and it was like the, the most incredible feeling uh, of this, all the, these like layers and layers of earth, you know, and, and it's just so, so amazing, this experience. And, you know, you see pictures and you're just like, oh, you know, it's just beautiful. But there was something different about it that you almost got high from it watching it. And I asked you about that. And you had mentioned that your brain was, try, was trying to calculate all the layers and all that because it just does that. It's like, how do we survive? And how far is this one and that one? But it was so overwhelming to our brain that it just kind of blows our mind in a way. And there, it just becomes empty. And we just have that state of awe. And that's really what we, our life, if we have more moments of that, where our life has that just being in awe of just be breathing and being alive and not having to put meaning to everything, that's where real freedom happens. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. Mm. So um, I love this topic. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Or if you're listening to us here on YouTube, uh, click here in the button in the corner and make sure you subscribe to our channel. And we'll continue with another great episode next week. And thank you for joining us. And if you have questions about your own personal narrative uh, we talked about today, don't forget to put your comments below. Mm -hmm.